Hello, and welcome to our detailed look at Draconis Invasion, a fantasy deck building game with some interesting new twists. Thank you, Jeff Lai and Keggy Games, for sending us a copy of this game to check out. Now, Draconis Invasion was designed by Jeff Lai and features some striking artwork from a number of people Juan Pablo Fernandez, Vuk Kostic, Manthos Lapis, Lagosh Pedrich, and Unreal Smoker was published in 2016, I think it's K-E-J-I, because they always put it in capitals, maybe it's Kedji, after a rather successful Kickstarter. Now, this non-clickable card game plays one to six players, with games taking up to an hour and a half, but much less with fewer players. Now, this has a MSRP of $75 Canadian. I'm pretty sure it's a Canadian company. I could not find a U.S. price. It's, very, it's around there somewhere, but $75 Canadian. Now, in Dracotis Invasion, you're a noble hero charged by your king to defend the kingdom from the invasion of the Draconis, a monstrous horde. You start with a handful of Imperial Guard and some gold, which you'll use to buy action cards and recruit more heroic defenders. These defenders will let you defeat invading troops, but only as long as you can afford to pay them. Earn additional glory for completing contracts for the king, which require you to defeat specific foes. And do all of this as terror builds, rushing the game to its end. Can one of you defeat enough of the Draconis invaders to save the realm, or will you all be forced to retreat? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure if calling them heroic defenders is all that appropriate. I mean, they're mercenary defenders. Yeah. <laughs> True now, enough, I was going with a term in the rule book. <laughs> Now, for a look at various cards, which come in three different sizes, and other components for this game, I welcome you to check out our Draconis Invasion unboxing video on YouTube. All right, first thing I want to talk about in regards to component quality here is the box the game comes in. So the box for this features a standard, like, fairly deep rectangular box with a trough in the middle that's obviously like, glued in that I found a little confusing because none of the three sections that are made by this are wide enough to fit the square cards that come in the game. Also, the graphics on the box are warped over the edges, wrapped, sorry, wrapped over the edges, and that causes cards at the end of the row to get caught there. And while having room for expansions is great, it's been many years since this game's released and it has one expansion, there is a lot of error in this box. And it also looks like the box grew at some point. Maybe it was a Kickstarter scratch hole or something because the instructions look like something that would go in a standard deck box. It just seems silly at the size they are for the box that came in and made it like harder to read. Like, blow them up. Give me a bigger box. Yeah, now actually, I, I did the sort for this, uh, this one. And while they did thankfully give you plenty of nice foam to hold things in place, boxes mm -hmm. of this style are just frustrating. And they don't make it easy or enjoyable to work with cards of varying sizes. I had the exact same complaints with the multiverse box for the DC deck builder. It's just not the right way to hold cards. Like, I almost wonder if they went to someone and said, give me the box of legendary games come in, where the center trough is actually for the play mat you roll up to play on and not for holding cards. Like, I, I'm wondering if maybe they went with a publisher or some a manufacturer that had offered them that. Like, oh, we can give you this box that we also use. I don't know. It's just not great at all. Yeah. Now, getting back to the rules, uh, though there are three copies. Ermin, Ermin? Wow. All right. There are three copies of the rules in English, German, and French. Uh, these are pretty clear and easy to read, include quite a bit of flavor text in addition to the game rules, including a whole section at the back that tells you who all the defenders are and who all the monsters are and everything else. Now, being a deck building game with a static market, the game does come with a number of layouts for you to try out with different types of cards, and they give you 10 different scenarios. And they're meant to be played in order with the final scenario, actually an 11th scenario, being to randomize the cards. So that's also available. Now, even though the rule book is, as Mo mentioned, small, it was pretty easy to read and flip through even with my aging eyes. Now, the cards themselves are of excellent quality, linen finish. They feel good in your hands. They don't slide around. They do come in three unusual sizes. So there's your standard playing card size. Then there's a skinnier card. Then there's two different types that way. One's landscape, one's not. And then there's also perfectly square cards. Well, rounded edges, but square cards, which does make sorting the cards a little easier. But I am so glad I don't sleep my games. 
They also include some taller dividers, which makes the cards organizing easy enough. And as Sean mentioned, there are foam blocks to hold things in place. Yeah, so the decks were not sorted into their individual <laughs> cards when I when we first opened it. So in order for me to sit down and sort this all out so that we could build these layouts easier as we you know, open up the book and the, the book and, and, and picked a layout to go with every deck had to be sorted out into the different piles in order to put them away. Right. It was really bizarre to, you know, have this great sorting mechanism and then print your cards in these groups that don't make any sense. As far as I can tell, Sean has never played a legendary game. <laughs> it is obvious. It never opened the legendary game. You know what's even worse? I sorted a ton of those during the unboxing. It was worse. I sorted them by card back at least. So right. at least you like had some sorting going on. Now the cards you do have include action and defender cards. Those are the ones you buy and build your deck with. Campaign cards that are for end game scoring. Invader cards at two levels. Those are the things you're fighting. Terror cards, which clog up your deck and advance the timeline. And finally event cards, which occur every time the terror level gets too high. So while well, as mentioned earlier, the art on these cards is great. Some of the pieces are indeed poster worthy, I think. Mm -hmm. But overall, the art is dark. And by that, I don't mean theme, though they are that as well. Mm -hmm. But primarily with these blacks and browns and dark grays. And as a result, identifying the cards from their images is no. not easy. Uh, this is not magic where you're going to go, oh, yeah, look across the table and you see a piece of art and you instantly know that, oh, that's the Mesa Pegasus or, you know, Angel of whatever. Yeah, that's not going to happen in this game. Uh, there are a couple of cards that do stand out in my mind mm -hmm. as other than dark. Uh, the Sorceress was a bright card yep. and really stood out, instantly recognizable. But other than that card in particular, they're all just a blur of yeah. dark. The action cards, every action card we saw just all blended together. There was a row of cards there. I, I couldn't tell you what the pictures were. And some of them, we couldn't even figure out what the picture was. The gold digging card, we never did figure out what that art was supposed to be. Yeah, no, it was it was strange. And I mean, it, it's probably a crop of something. And if you were like, you know, if you were able to zoom out and see what the artist was picturing in its entirety, it would make perfect sense. But I, I can't yeah. quite tell what this is. <laughs> If anyone does have that game, let us know what that picture is supposed to be because yeah. we passed that around the table trying to figure that one out. Yep. Now, another thing the game does come with is a D6 die that has nice big numbers on it, which is great because you have to read things from across the table because this is used to track the terror level and everyone needs to be able to see it. Then there's the mystery item, the black cloth bag that is in there for no reason. There is nothing in this game that needs a bag. Nothing. This was confusing enough that I went online looking for a use for the bag, wondering if there was something in the original Kickstarter or some expansion or something print and play or some. No one seems to have figured out what this is for. There are multiple threads out there discussing this bag, but no answer to its existence that I ran across. So what I decided is this is the bag that we're going to throw in Adventuria for the hero tokens to randomize things because the bag that does come with Adventuria is a little tight. <laughs> That's what it's for. It's to help out another game from another publisher. I, same thing. If you know what the art is on the gold and you know what the bag's for, hit us up. Well, now that you've got a good idea of what you get with this deck building game, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, you start a game at Draconis Invasion by deciding what action and defender cards you want to use. Now, there is one card from each of these types that's always in play. The other five cards, though, you swap up between games. Now, as mentioned earlier, the rules include 10 different scenarios that are meant to be played in order. And then once you finish those, you unlock random market play. <clears throat> now, while initially I sort of dismissed the progression, and I'll admit it's not supported by any lore or text no. in the manual, it did mix things up nicely and change mm. things up as we went. We even found ourselves concerned when we knew that a card that we had perhaps been leaning on a little heavily wasn't going to be available yeah. in the next round. And to me, that's a good sign. They've done something right if you can become invested in the progression. Yep. 
Now, I did think Sean called out something that I totally missed while writing this up earlier is the fact there's no fluff, which is weird because there's lots of fluff for this game. I would have preferred a progression that told the story as well. That would have been a nice touch is some kind of story system that goes, well, the first round, you're just setting up your initial defenses against the scouts to it's a full on siege in game 10. That would have been a nice touch. Now, there are there are titles to the setups, so yeah. you can sort of guess at what where it's going at. But it, it, there's nothing, it's literally, you've got a title to work with, and that's yeah. it. Now, the market itself is created with all copies of the cards. So all six, uh, your action cards, all six defenders, you put them all into play. There's no modifying that for player count, and there's no game end if any of these run out, like some other deck building games this is similar to. Now, the rest of the cards are all just shuffled, placed near the board. Um, you're going to flip some face up, like you're going to put three of each level of invader up and three campaign cards cards face up your event deck you're going to build based on the number of players those are just put on top of a retreat card so you don't get to look at these you just shuffle them up put the set number on the retreat card and then players collect their starting decks which as usual in these games is kind of garbage you get seven wealth cards worth 10 gold each and five imperial guards which can attack for five damage but thankfully work for free an opening to uh anyone who's played almost any deck builder based off dominion should be familiar with all right, start player is determined by the roll of the threat die, and then that player rolls it again to set the starting threat level at the beginning of the game. Now, this number is referenced on this starting threat card, which gives all players some cards to start with. Um, based on what we saw, I don't think we did see every number, you tend to get at least one threat card and then some starting gold. And the gold could be like the really good gold because the gold's the, like it goes wealth, then something, then fortune. You might wealth, start with wealth, fortune. treasure, and fortune. Yeah, Wealth, Treasure, and Fortune. Like, two times in our games, we started with Fortune, which was huge. Uh, both of these just go in your discard pile, though, so you're not going to get them in your starting hands or your beginning couple rounds. Yeah. Now, interestingly, this reference card for the starting threat is just the starting threat, which yeah. put away after you, you make that one roll at the very beginning before the game starts. Yeah, that one confused me because I thought when I'd seen a Watch It Played video that I'd watched for this, that it was something that was going to keep happening, that as the threat escalated, you'd just keep getting stuff. And I'm glad it's not. Having now played the game, that would be horrible. You'd be getting a threat every flipping time the die spun up and it wouldn't work. So I get it. But yeah, it's interesting. And what I do like is it, it makes it so the beginning of the games do change up. Like there are only six different options, but still six different options with your different cards and everything does add another layer of replayability. Now, each round of Draconis Invasion uses this, I, I want to say patented, because they should in a way, A, B, C, D, E, F system. So A to F system, which I thought was really brilliant. On a turn, you may do A, then you do one of B, C, D, or E, and then you may do F. And each of these represent a different action. Here's a quick summary of those. So A, action. Play an action card from your hand, do what it says. Note, some action cards will give you additional actions. This will be familiar to anyone who's played Dominion. B, buy. Buy a card from the market. Play gold cards. Spend the income earned to buy one card from the market, either an action or a defender. Again, some action cards will give you additional buys. You give another flashback to Dominion. Next is campaign. Draw, draft two campaign cards. These can either come from the face-up cards or drawn from the top of your deck. These are kept secret for endgame scoring. D, defeat. Attempt to defeat an invader. Play a number of defender cards from your hand, as well as enough gold to pay them, and then collect an invader whose health is equal to or less than your total attack value of the paid defender cards. Reveal a new invader and do what it says in the card, which will involve you getting a terror card somewhere, whether in your deck or on the top of your deck or in the discard. E is eliminate. Eliminate a card from your hand. This lets you prune your deck by returning a card to the market. Now, those are your A, B, A you, had, you had an option. B, C, D, and E are a choice. You have to do one of those. Then you have F, follow. At the end of your turn, or sorry, forward. I wrote follow, it's forward. At the end of your turn, you can forward one gold card from your hand, which could be of all, any of the three levels, and place it face down on top of your deck. Honestly, the simplicity of this system is subtle, but powerful. One problem with many deck builders is the turn action order, trying to remember what you can and can't do and in what order you can do it by using a, a memnonic already known by everyone in the three languages you're printing your game for. Mm -hmm. You've just eliminated the problem of trying to remember that order uh, just yep. straight off the bat. 
<laughs> we're French, English, and German. We're all using the same alphabet. So you've learned if you're able to play this game, A, B, C, D, E, F. Yeah, I love it. A, B, C, D, or E, then F. I love it. it. It's just really good. It was great for teaching. Like we played a bunch of games and Deanna joined us and I'm like, look, just grab this card. That's what you do. It's like, yep, that makes sense. Now, along with that general gameplay flow, Every time you have to discard a terror card from your hand, that's important, you advance the threat die one level. When it hits a six, which is this like screaming skull pitcher, an event card is drawn, but not played right away. It's handed to the next player. Now, if the die gets additional threat, it keeps rolling over. So it goes from six back to one and it can keep rolling. And multiple events can trigger in one turn if enough terror cards are discarded by one player. And it's important that it's at the start of the next player's turn that they read out the event cards that uh, were, you know, earned. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and that's when it takes place. You still finish your turn and redraw before the effects of terror hit you yes. or, or anyone. Now, after advancing the threat die, play passes to the next player. This continues until one player has defeated a set number of invaders, determined by the player count, or the retreat card is revealed at the bottom of the event deck. Note that last event doesn't happen. As soon as you can see that card, it's over. At this point, players add up all their glory. Uh, the monsters have a glory value on them. You're going to add any bonus glory for completed campaigns. One of the things to note is the only thing worth victory points in this is defeating the invaders. There's no, like, none of the cards you're buying to fill your deck are worth points which is something in many modern deck building games do. Player with the most glory wins the game. And while mechanically you're going to have points, one of the two players will win from a story point. It's worth considering that it's a loss against the game if that retreat card emerged and you didn't finish, kill the, the correct number of uh, enemies to end the game in that manner. What's odd is it's not just a game loss, no one wins. It's odd that it's still, like, to be honest, it's just a timing mechanism. To me, that removes the theme from the game. By having it, like, you all lost, all your efforts were for nothing. I think I think it would have been actually better if that retreat card made it a everyone loses to make the game have more of that competitive nature. Now, due to this being a card-based deck-building game, of course, there are a number of cards that may break the rules. I shouldn't say may, they all do. All the cards, basically, all the action cards in particular break the rules in some way, uh, providing additional actions, uh, additional uses of the ADF system, or stuff that's completely apart from the ADF system. They include all the stuff you'd expect in a deck builder, such as upgrading cards to better ones, drawing more cards from your deck, searching your deck for specific cards, swapping out the invaders that are attacking, and so on. Well, now that we know how to play, let's move on to our thoughts about Draconis Invasion. All right, I gotta admit, when I first sat down to learn this game, I wasn't expecting much. And that trepidation got worse once I started actually reading some of the cards that Sean was putting out. So Sean taught this game, so thumbs up, thanks for that. Um, once I started to see some of the cards, I'm like, wow, I'm getting a lot of flashbacks to Dominion. And I don't necessarily love Dominion. It feels a little dated to me. So like, like some of these action cards are word for word from Dominion. They just changed the name. They do all the things like get an extra action and draw two cards or discard X cards from your hand and draw this many new ones from your deck. Like those are cards that are right from both games. And what I was pleased to find is once we start playing, yes, this is still an aspect of the game. Yes, it definitely shows its roots. There's enough other stuff going on that I didn't feel like I was playing Dominion with add-ons, instead playing a, a bigger game. And to be honest, it's turned into an advantage because it made the game feel familiar. So I didn't have to worry about those base mechanics. I could focus on the new stuff. Yeah, and, and even if you haven't played Dominion, it's far from unapproachable. Yeah. While I wouldn't consider this a gateway deck builder per se, it's certainly not wildly complex and anyone with any number of, uh, any number of uh, other deck builders under their belt should pick it up really quickly. Now, a big part of that other stuff that isn't in Dominion is the way you have to pay for your defender cards to use them. This is something I've never seen before. I've played a lot of deck builders, a lot of fantasy deck builders, and I've never seen this particular mechanic because not only do you have to buy the card from the market and get it in your deck, and then it's got to come up. When it does come up, you've got to pay for it to use it. And this took the longest time to get used to. Like, I, I even by, I think by game five, I was starting to finally 
figure out how much money I needed my deck to make this work. And when it doesn't, it can be extremely frustrated when your defenders just keep coming up, but you never have enough money or when you have enough money, you never have a defender. Yeah. Well, highly thematic, it is intentionally punishing. Mm. Managing resources to buy is straightforward enough, but then you have to work those same engines and combos that bought you the cards to use the card mm. that you already bought. This game is designed to feel like an uphill battle. You're losing. You're being attacked by an unimaginably vast enemy and hope is in short supply as the crushing fear of the encroaching waves of enemies build up in you, leaving you crippled. Now, while it achieves this very well at times, mm -hmm. it might be argued that it achieves it a bit too well sometimes. Yes. Now, the one thing I did appreciate in this game, I already mentioned it basically, is the ABCDEF system. Uh, this worked really well, made teaching new players the game very easy. Uh, the step names actually managed to be thematic and fit the letter pattern. So I'm like, whoever was able to come up with those, good job. Um, I also like the fact that calling a card from your deck is an action you can just take. Like that's just one of your options is ditch a card. I love that. You, you don't need some special card or you don't need the right thing to come up. I yeah, That is great. I'd love to see that more deck builders. The other thing I like, and I have seen this in other games, is the ability to put something on the top of my deck and save it for next turn is something else I appreciate. And Draconis does this with the, the wealth cards, which again, make sure you have that money to pay for your guys or to buy the stuff. Yeah, mechanically, this game is really quite straightforward. If you take the time to ensure what the cards and rules actually say, because their wording is very specific, it turns yes. out, uh, you probably won't be making any horrible errors. You do occasionally have to take the time, though, and really read and, and double read things sometimes to, uh, to ensure that you are playing correctly. So next, I want to talk a bit about the most controversial part of this game, at least based on what we've seen from other reviewers, and that is the entire terror and event system. Now, this is something else I've not seen before in a deck building game. Well, I have played many games with punitive cards, stuff that like, even the original Dominion, uh, the, the cards that score your points clog up your deck, right? And that's, that's a pretty standard thing. And while terror cards do clog up your deck, they do more than that. Because having a lot of terror in your deck not only means you're not going to draw as good a hand, right? You're going to have a harder time getting cards you can use together. It also advances the game towards the end, which causes events. And every event in the game causes people to get more terror. So it just compounds. Now, this also has an added effect that due to the way terror works, you don't want to thin your deck. There is almost no way to remove the, the punitive cards which is just feels weird because almost every other deck builder I've ever played is all about making the most efficient thin deck that you can cycle through. And the goal of most of them is to be able to draw your entire hand every turn. You don't want to do that in this game. That means you've drawn every terror card you have every turn. Now, that is one issue of it, and it is so hard to eliminate terror. There is one way in the entire game, and it's I think it was an event, that lets you eliminate a card randomly from your hand. That's not even something that's going to happen every game. And you definitely can't base a strategy around that. Yeah. And in fact, in all the games we played, only once was a, any terror card ever eliminated from a hand. Yes. Now, there are some ways to skip drawing mm -hmm. them into your hand, which means you do, if you don't draw them into your hand, you can't discard them from your hand. Uh, which helps hold back the onrushing tide of despair, but that's a stopgap measure at best. Yeah, and there's the there's only a couple action cards that were, or character cards that will even allow you to do that. So it's not even like they'll be there in every game. Now, as for the events themselves, I have some mixed thoughts on these. Like my first issue is despite giving you a large deck of adventure cards, 16 total, there's only four different types. So there's four copies of four of the same card. And that just made events feel repetitive and boring. Like by game two, maybe by game three, I'm like, oh, that again, that again. And it got to the point where I didn't even have to hear the card. I just asked, does it go on my deck or does it go in my discard? Because that was the end result of most of these. Or there was one where you discarded cards. But like terror, you'd say terror on, terror in the discard, terror just like we stopped reading them. It didn't matter. The second problem is that every single one of these events is designed to punish the leader. They're a catch-up mechanic. 
Now, besides lacking variety, because every single one just attacks a leader, you don't get any moving around, it encourages players to hold back and not take the lead and try and be in second place and or worse than second place. And it dissuades you from taking the big monsters to attacking the gold-backed invader cards because those are the tiebreakers. So if two people have the same amount of things they've killed, whoever killed the most gold wins the tie. And that just has players not doing it. And both of these end up making the game longer. Like people just hold back while they could be doing things. And while I think these are very valid player responses, like like the, the psychology of this, backing off makes sense. To me, it is completely against the theme of the game. And I honestly think against the design intention as well. Yeah, indeed. This would be my number one complaint of the game. These need variety. And even if they are only ever going to attack uh, the kill leader, a better spread of things of, of outcomes could reduce the need mm -hmm. for players to avoid killing things if you knew it might not be as soul crushing and punishing a result <laughs> when it came up then you might just take more chances and do more yeah it also stops players after they played a few rounds it does take a bit to realize this meta to just rush out and kill the cheapest things as quick as possible because if you do that your deck gets filled with terror before you put much else in it and it just constantly you get terrible hands and you can do nothing. So like I said, mixed feelings, because in a way, I, I like the fact there's a catch-up mechanic. If someone does try to rush to kill all the things, they're going to get penalized for it. And I think that fits. I really hate the turtling that happens. The I'm just going to wait up and sit back and just kind of play through and try not to do anything because I don't want the terror to happen. It just totally breaks the immersion in the theme. Now, this lack of variety in event cards is repeated in other areas of the game as well. There's only four different invaders in the low level. Like there's a nice deck, but again, it's it's four of four. There's 16 cards or something like that. And there are only four different ones, which I didn't even notice when playing. It was something when I was when I was getting ready for the review, I went through the deck. Campaign cards, I would have assumed there was at least one campaign card for every monster type. There's not only a small subset of the monster types are on the campaign cards. And then there are way more campaign cards than you could possibly ever score, which seemed like an odd choice to me. So I don't know why they did it that way, but it seems odd to have like six copies of kill two skeletons when there's only four skeletons in the game. That just seemed like an odd design choice to me. So this didn't bother me as much. And I think it's designed uh, particularly for the, to, to work for the six player game. So in a six player game, everyone can be trying to kill two skeletons but Even not everyone is going to be able to score it. Yeah, so you're going to end up with you're going to end up with campaigns that go unused in the large player games. Now they could have gone through and and you know in a smaller player game sort the deck, move. but that would have been a pain to do, and it doesn't really hurt the game for them to be there. Yes, it was it was yeah. odd, but it didn't actually hurt me uh, hurt it much. And while I, I did know there was an expansion, and I don't think games should make you need to get an expansion. Playing through this game, I wanted one, not because anything was missing, but because I wanted more. I just yeah. wanted to keep going. Uh, mainly events. Like, I know they're in there. I've seen the expansion, but like, <laughs> the, the, there is, I, I did want more variety. Now, I also do feel the need to point out the rules aren't the most clear at times. Um, some of the card abilities can be a bit ambiguous. Now, there is an FAQ section of the rule book, which just points you online. That I don't like. I would like, like, you know, if you're going to reprint your rule book, put some of the FAQ in there at least. Still give me a link online. Uh, for a couple of the cards, we went to the FAQ online and they weren't addressed at all. Now, the rule book does include a rule summary, uh, like a, a summary of all the card abilities. But this is odd. All they did was repeat the text on the cards. So if you don't understand the text of the cards, you're like, oh, look it up in the book for the... No, that's the exact same text, which is just weird. Usually when they put the, the rules in the book, there's like a more detailed description of how a card works, maybe step by step through this, then this, then this. Um, there were answers for everything. It's just some of them could be interpreted multiple ways. So basically what we did is we played the card, we handed it around. What do you think it says? What do you think it says? What do you think it says? Came to an agreement and just stuck with it for all our games. Now, I will say what was interesting is we played everything right according to the designer. So we, we at least saw the proper intent, though I'm still kind of surprised by the one card, the gold digging card, I did not think would let you cycle through terror. Yeah, it's, it's the one mechanic that... Uh that allows you to sort of bypass the terror. Um, and, and I have to say, the, the card summary in the rule book is useless. Yeah, what, why? Why are you just rewriting the text 
in an even smaller form, because again, this is a smaller rule book. Uh, so you've, you've taken the, te the card text and shrunken it down even smaller to, uh, to write it out there. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, I don't, don't get that. So overall, this game has left me conflicted. Like on one hand, this game's got its flaws, but then it's got some neat stuff too. Uh, like the action system, like uh, not the A through F, like the action cards and playing action cards is kind of boring. Like it just, I, it's Dominion. So you got Dominion with this other stuff. But then I love the whole do an A, then do a B, C, D, or E, then do an F. I, like I love that. So that was a great system. And I like the fact that like a buy is a different action than an attack. Um, the fact you have to pay for your defenders is really interesting. It, it is the most unique part of this game and fits really well thematically. Like, yes, you hire your mercenaries. You have to pay for them to use them. And no, the, the prices aren't the same, right? You might hire them for 60. Well, it only takes 40 to use them, right? There's, there's some of that play going on. But more often than not, it just led to frustration. Like, so frustrating. And while the game has some big win moments where you pulled off the thing and did the impressive thing, they're so far apart that I don't even know if it makes up for those moments of frustration. On the other hand, the terror event thing worked. I thought it was neat, but there's just not enough variety, which is the same problem I personally found with the invasion and campaign deck. I'm like, I'm fighting the same monsters over and over again. It's no longer, I'm like, yes, I have 15, I kill a succubus. Oh, I have 10, I kill skeletons. Oh, I got up to 30, I kill this. And it just kind of became like almost rote, like what you did when you get the certain attack levels. The thing is, with all these potential flaws and bumps and things that we didn't love it ended up being really fun and well that's really important thing right like the best games in your collection are the ones that hit your table and the ones that hit the table tend to be the ones that are most fun like we broke out this game for the first time this was early in the morning well not that early we slept in a bit but early enough in the morning <laughs> after our first coffee and we planned on like let's play it a couple times to get a feel for it and I wasn't planning on reviewing this for a couple of weeks at least, right? Playing a couple of time, more times. But we end up spending the entire afternoon playing, playing and enjoying and exploring Draconis Invasion. Like, honestly, the only reason we stopped is because Sean was in town and we were like, we need to get these other games played for the pile of obligation. We need to play unfair. That's important. Uh, so we probably could have kept going. And Deanna actually was like, no, no, let's play some more. I'm like, but we played five times already. Like, like I, 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 I don't know. I don't, there's something about this game that just kept drawing us back for more. Now I will say that the rules have some variants mm -hmm. solo two player and their teams mode each have slight variations for setup and finishing rules while three to six players is all by the book. I personally found that when D joined us uh, after our first couple of games and we started playing three player, the game felt more solid than it mm -hmm. did at two. I, agree. I probably would have stopped playing significantly sooner if we'd kept playing only with two players. Yeah. Uh, for one thing, the terror mechanic uh, is exceedingly punishing at two player. Uh, and it felt just, it just felt so much more oppressive at that count. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the lack of variation really kind of mm -hmm. stood out at two players. A good example of that is every single game two player, we lost. Every single game we got to the retreat card. None of our three player games that happened. Someone won for getting it, defeating enough enemies every time. So I think that just shows how much more punishing the two player is compared to the other levels. Yeah. So should you pick this game up right should you buy draconis invasion if you can find a copy of it um if you enjoy deck building games check it out like, like i'd strongly consider say you should check this out maybe not or something buy it find a demo find a way to play go to a local game event um find a way to try the game out well a lot of the game is stuff you've probably seen before um draconis invasion adds some new elements that put quite the twist on things while the game's not perfect there is quite a lot of fun despite its flaws. Now I suggest, I don't even know what word just came up most. I suggest this game even more for fans who like fantasy 
beat up the monster style deck builders, right? So not just Dominion fans and people who like the uh, eminent domain. Like these are the games where you're collecting a team and then you're going to beat up a bad guy. And this doesn't just mean not even just deck builders, right? Valeria card kingdoms would fall into this where you're, you're collecting all your resources to go explore the dungeon to kill the bad guy. If you're into that, you might just want to pick this up straight up. I really think there's a lot to dig here especially if you're into the theme of having to hire your mercenaries and pay for them. There's something about this game that reminds me of like old school role-playing. I have a feeling that, that like purists and ground yards and, and dungeon crawl fans will like that aspect of having to hire your defenders and play them during play. Now, if you're looking for a light fun romp, this <laughs> isn't your game. It's hard. And while I'm sure like anything, you'll pick up tricks and combos to help the more you play and, and become more skilled at it. It's hard enough that if you're not willing to give it a few plays and try things, it could leave you with a bad taste in your mouth after a first yeah. play. Now, if you aren't a fan of deck building games, this isn't one of those games that's going to sell you on deck building or change your mind. I really don't think so. At its heart, it is a purely, pretty pure static market deck builder, right? That's one where the cards don't change every round. You set them at the beginning of the game. And it's got that 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 core mechanic, the roots that the other stuff's built on. I don't think the other stuff is going to be enough if you don't like those roots. Now, personally, I am really got, glad I got to try this one out. I am so glad that I reached out and was like, yeah, yeah, I'll check this game out. It sounds cool. My my partner loves loves deck builders. So yeah, a new fantasy deck builder, I'll check it out. I am so glad I did because now I have a copy of this game. I am really looking forward to exploring Draconis Invasion Wraith. Wrath. I always want to say Wraith. Draconis Invasion Wrath. That is the expansion which features 12 scenarios that you play in order that each unlock a new sealed pack of cards with story, which is part of what I thought was missing in the progression here. Now, some of this I know are more invaders and new events. So that may just take care of a couple of the problems I found with the base game. Well, that's it for our look at Draconis Invasion, the deck building game. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com.